In the past, we've taken a look at some of the common sayings that most people use in day-to-day -day speech, but many of us use them incorrectly. This can be because we've misheard them, or because they contain a word we have never heard of, or maybe they simply make more sense to us that way. Regardless of the reason, or dare we say irregardless, these erroneous expressions have made their way into the common lexicon, and in some cases have become even more popular than the original correct sayings. And guess what? There are plenty more where those came from, so today, oh, we're taking a look at 10 more of them. Number 10, mute point. During an argument or debate, if someone makes a statement that is irrelevant to the subject at hand, it might get dismissed as a mute point. Or if you want to be correct, you would dismiss it as a moot point, because that is the right expression. The term mute point is an egg corn, which is a misheard word or phrase that sounds similar to the words it replaces and even retains its original meaning. The most popular egg corns can sometimes become more common than the correct counterpart, and this is mainly due to two reasons. One, the egg corn still makes some sense, and two, the original phrase can contains an antiquated word that most people would be unfamiliar with. Both reasons apply in this case. You can see why someone would think that an irrelevant point would be a muted or silenced point. At the same time, the right word, moot, has been around for a thousand years since the times of the Anglo-Saxons, but nowadays it is mainly used in law, so your average person will not encounter it too many times in their everyday lives. Number 9. Beck and Cool if you make yourself available to serve someone at a moment's notice, day or night, you might say that you are at their beck and call. However, some people might think that you are in fact at their beck and call. The latter is another example of an egg corn, but in this context, the word beckon does make some sense since it means to attract someone's attention with a gesture. However, the idiom's biggest problem is that the real world beck has become obsolete. It is a fossil word, meaning that it has fallen completely out of use in modern English, but still appears in phrases and idioms. In other words, you are highly unlikely to ever use the word beck outside of the phrase beck and call unless you are debating whether Odile or Mellow Gold was the better album. Number 8. Scapegoat. Someone who takes the blame for something that wasn't really their fault is often described as a scapegoat. That term comes from the English translation of the Old Testament. In the book of Leviticus, Aaron takes two goats. While the first is sacrificed outright, the other one, which is the scapegoat, is sent into the wilderness carrying the sins of the Israelites so that it may be punished instead of them. Meanwhile, the scapegoat is yet another egg corn, even though in this particular case the correct and incorrect phrases mean the exact same thing. Scape is just an old-fashioned way of saying escape, and if we want to be extra pedantic, we can point out that scapegoat itself was an English mistranslation from Hebrew. Originally, it said Azazel, the name of a demon, which was wrongfully translated as Ezozel, meaning goat that departs. This mistranslation remained in use for centuries. Nowadays, both the contemporary English and the American Standard versions of the Bible have changed it back to Azazel, but the scapegoat thing isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Number 7. Scotch Free If you manage to escape a situation without any repercussions, you might say that you got off scot free, although many use the erroneous alternative Scotch Free. Some use the second version because uh, they might have heard it incorrectly, while others purposefully avoid the expression Scotch Free because uh, they fear it might be derogatory towards Scottish people. If you are among them, you can rest easy. The saying has nothing to do with Scots or Scotch. In medieval England, Scotch was the name for tax defined in the Middle English compendium as payment for food or drink at a social gathering. It was derived from the even older Norse word scot, and someone who managed to wriggle his way out of paying the tax was described as scot-free. Number 6. Chomping at the bit Someone who is restless or shows a lack of restraint can be described as chomping at the bit, or as the original saying went, champing at the bit. This is a situation where the incorrect idiom has become so widely used that even some dictionaries have started recognizing it as an acceptable variation of the original. The problem is that the word champ is a fossil word, meaning that it has become mostly obsolete outside of it still being used in idioms and phrases. In this particular case, the saying champing at the bit is the only place where you are likely to hear this archaic word, which was used to refer to the grinding of a horse's teeth. The expression itself dates back to the early 19th century and comes from horse racing, where the bit was a piece of iron that was part of the bridle and inserted into the horse's mouth to help control him. Restless horses often chewed on their bits, hence the expression, but it seems that even the experts are ready to embrace the modern version, which uses the verb chomp. Number 5. Say your piece. Let's say you've just had an argument with someone and uh, you've spoken about everything that was on your mind. Do you say, say your piece, P-I-E-C-E, -E, or do you say, say peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. It's the first one. Say your peace, I-E-C-E, -E, not say your peace, E-A-C-E. -E. This is all confusing. 
we know. You could probably see how the mix-up happens since the two words are homophones. They are pronounced the same but have different meanings. Then there is also the similar but unrelated idiom, hold your peace, which means to stay quiet and keep your objections to yourself. That's the expression we hear in every wedding scene on television and the one that does use the word peace, E-A-C-E. -E. So if you want to speak up, then it is peace, I-E-C-E, -E, but if you intend to stay quiet, then it is peace, E-A-C-E. -E. So we hope that clears everything up. Number four, shoe in. Here is one example that is a bit more straightforward, even though we are dealing with two homophones again. Shoe, as in the footwear, and shoe, as in the verb meaning to scare something away by shouting and waving your arms about. If we want to refer to something as a guaranteed winner, we might call them a shoe in. In this particular case, the second spelling, as in the thing you wear on your feet, is incorrect. Some people might reason that it refers to something fitting as well as a foot in a shoe, which makes it a pretty good egg corn, because not only does it sound like the original saying, but it also retains some of the meaning. The correct version, however, is shoe in, as in to shoe something away. The idiom dates back to the 1930s and comes from horse racing again. Back then, whenever jockeys fixed a race, they would hold back their own horses and shoe along the winner in a final stretch. Therefore, a shoe in referred to someone guaranteed to come out on top, although it also had an implication of cheating or dishonesty that no longer exists today. Number three, blow a casket. Just to be clear, if you have a leaf blower, a coffin, and some free time on your hands, you literally could blow a casket. However, you cannot metaphorically blow a casket, meaning to lose your temper and and react furiously because the correct expression is to blow a gasket. In this case, it is a little strange that the incorrect saying is so pervasive since the wrong expressions with true staying power are the ones that either retain the original meaning or make sense on their own. In this case, blowing a casket is pretty nonsensical, while blowing a gasket is a relatively common engine problem. The confusion probably stems from the fact that many people who are not mechanically inclined do not know the word gasket, meaning a piece of rubber or other soft material fitted in a joint to prevent fluids from escaping. When a gasket fails, the effect is usually immediate and energetic, so the saying makes perfect sense. But those who are unfamiliar with it simply replaced the word with a one that they had heard of, and that's how they ended up blowing a casket. Number two, tongue in cheek. If you say something humorous or sarcastic, but deliver it in a serious manner, you could say that you delivered the line tongue-in-cheek. But to make sure that if you do use the expression, you place that tongue firmly in the cheek, because if you say tongue and cheek, as many people do, then you are just listing off body parts. Switching in to and seems like a pretty easy and minor mistake to make, but the expression only makes sense if the tongue is in the cheek, since that is what people physically did to show the sarcasm or humor in their statements. In fact, originally, it was meant to show contempt for the other person. The practice makes an appearance in Tobias Smollett's 1748 novel The Adventures of Roderick Ransom, where the main character signifies his disdain for a cowardly passenger by thrusting his tongue in his cheek, which humbled him so much that he scarce swore another oath aloud during the whole journey. Over the decades, the meaning of the physical act changed, and by the mid-19th century, the phrase had made its way into various poems and novels with its modern connotation. Number one, for all intensive purposes. We finish up today Today's video with a look at the expression for all intents and purposes, meaning for all practical purposes, which is way too often misused as intensive purposes. The correct expression is almost 500 years old, dating back to an act of parliament in Britain which gave King Henry VIII the power to interpret laws to all intents, constructions, and purposes. It seemed like the British people liked the saying, so they continued using it mainly in legal documents, although they dropped the constructions part for whatever reason. Then when the expression made its way to America, it was changed one more time to for all intents instead of to all intents. The eggcorn variation for all intensive purposes is much younger than that, although the earliest recorded example still dates to 1870, so this is one error that has been around for a while and probably isn't going away anytime soon.